Okay, so let's we'll start. Uh, so people will join uh, accordingly. So good morning, everyone, and welcome to again once again the medical MCQ for all. I'm going quickly with a few slides, but important for those who joined first time. So this is a medical MCQ for all is a established company in India as well as in UAE. I just came back. A few doctors met me in Dubai as well in Abu Dhabi. So I'm very glad and uh, we had a very nice meeting in Dubai. Uh, so uh, the, I mean, we are the one of the best company in that sense. We have a special features of live online coaching, which most of the, uh, I mean, website or company, they unfortunately, they does not have what we are doing there every time. The mock test is a live session. And we provide almost everything, Prometric 1000 MCQ, book, ebook. We provide online subscriptions and coaching. We also provide Oman Viva coaching and subscription data flow services for all speciality, not just for the doctors. We also have one excellent package design, your sort package with money back guarantee. Those who have especially designed for those who have second or last attempt, third attempt. We have excellent mobile application in Android and iPhone. So those who did not download it, you go to the Android or iPhone, this uh, mobile store, you can get it, download it free. And we have dedicated recently launched the mock test. So by this is one of the best series we started recently on our website. You can check your own score, right? So give the exam, you can check your own score, how much you are getting before really going to the exams because it's very important. Now, how do you assess yourself? Right? Where are you standing? What's your score? It is optimal or not? Just going blankly to the exam, come back with a failure does not. I mean, it's a waste of time, money, and energy as well. So uh, don't be in a hurry of getting the exam date. By my sense, you need to give fair amount of mock test. At least I recommend initially at least two mock tests per week. Check your score. If your score is improving, I'm happy. If not, then you need to work out on your weaker parts that why the score is not improving and as per our website the general i mean uh, this time frame what i usually advise is like getting at least 70 to 75 percent in each mock test consistently for three to five mock tests if you are getting then it's a reasonable time to give the exam right cut to cut 55 60 percent is not good idea because if something goes wrong in the exam you are at trouble so we don't need anyone to be in trouble. So seriously do the mock test, believe me, and check your score. If you have any problems, you just get back to me or my team. We are more than 10 doctors in the team. Uh, surgical, medical, gynec, respiratory, cardio, myself, hemato, onco. So everybody will guide you properly. So just concentrate well on that mock test. So extremely important, right? So you won't get surprised in the exam when something uh, like these things, because if you do a fair amount of mock test, with a good result, you will be happy, right? So let's see. Uh, that's the thing is, uh, this is myself, as I told you, I'm hematoncologist and bone marrow transplant fellow. And uh, I also crack myself DHA, OMSB, Kenyan Medical, Australian Medical, and a few other exams. And I'm a member of American Society of Clinical Oncology. I just attended in May, June. Uh, one of the best conference in the world for medical oncology. So I'm a life member of American Society of Clinical Oncology as well. So, and uh, coaching and teaching experience is almost more than, I mean, overall 20 years I'm teaching every day, but hardcore teaching and full-fledged uh, is for at least now 10 years plus. So I try my level best to justify my subjects. Dr. Arti is a pediatric consultant and she is also taking regular lectures uh, as well as Dr. Maddy is a cardiologist and Dr. Ankit is a gastroenterologist, again excellent speaker will have. Dr. Shikha is a consultant gynecologist, I mean recently shifted to Astor Dubai, 3-4 months back so those who are in Dubai she can also help you out. Dr. Deepal is also a consultant gynecologist in our team and there are a lot of people along with the Anjali who is a head data flow based at Dubai and Pallavi, right? So this is all our excellent team and many other people's uh, back of the companies like IT and all. This is recently updated Prometric 1000 MCQ books. So those who are interested extremely in hard copy book, they can order it online and recently we had uh introduce excellent uh this uh discounted mock 
this combo package so pallavi you contact pallavi or me will guide you so there are more than 60 70 percent discount on each uh, combo offers which includes coaching as well so that part is also i mean we are to trying to work it on work it out on that pro thing so i mean it's is a it's a affordable and easily accessible to everyone that's what our try is so that's it and uh, as i told you we recently uh, very glad to announce that we recently started the emery residency programs coaching as well so we launched already on 28th of the 9 2024 in dubai so we already launched there are more than 25 doctors who attended from various part of ua including alain abu dhabi sarja dubai i'll share some pictures and it was amazing and it was wonderful so anybody your colleague interested in emery that is Emirates Medical Residency Exam post MBBS. Those who wants to do further uh, post graduation in UAE, they can get uh, advice as well as there any questions related with Emory. Just let us know later on, so we can also guide you for that as well. So that's it. Let's start our main business uh, of mock test. So get ready. I want you to check your score. Right? You don't need to display me. Be more sincere. I'm saying people are preparing, but they are not that sincere enough. You try give honestly speaking let me tell you this is absolutely a just two months job only two months job if you are dedicated two months yourself i am 100 percent sure and guarantee you today you will 100 percent pass just give a two dedicated months right you don't need to do haphazardly we all are expert we all are doctors right so we don't want to do something haphazardly right so try to do it properly right so let's start check your score how much you are getting what's your concept where you are lacking make a list of the uh, topics where you are absolutely weak you never know what comes in the exam na? all toxic question comes all, all weird comes what will you do it's waste of time and money and frustrations as well on top of this that is gifted if we don't cannot get through so be more sincere see the way i am sincere i am every sunday for last year completely even i was in dubai for two sunday i was sitting in front of computer i did not miss even in dubai even in abu dhabi when i was there i took same time same exactly 11 o'clock ua time i was in front of computer i also have a dedication i'm not charging single penny to anyone right why should i do extra efforts for you guys you do it everything is on one website why you want to do the mock test I am so sincere, you should become more sincere for yourself, right? I don't need to get the license. You need to get the license. So bottom line, make some sincerity, make some timetable. Any problem, get back to me. I would be extremely happy to guide you personally, even one-to-one. -one. So don't worry, but be more sincere, right? So check your score and send it to me later on, right? If you shy in group, send it to me, your score today. So first questions in front of your screen, a diabetic female on INH, that is isoniazide, and rifampicin for tuberculosis. She was started on warfarin. PT means prothrombin time is not raised. And what would be the next step? Right? Are you going to increase the dose of warfarin? Are you going to replace the warfarin with acuronmarin? Are you switch this ithambutol for rifampicin? Or are you going to use the LMWH heparin or low molecular weight heparin because warfarin is not working much well? prothrombin time is uh, not raised right uh, so so along with this other question so first you need to decide right what is the answer number one if you have any questions try to discuss you have we, this is absolutely don't shy there are a lot of people shying interacting don't worry about right or wrong this is a learning platform right nobody's perfect learning platform try to clarify your concept so other three questions, warfare and acts on which clotting factor? This is another exam question. I just try to make 10 questions in one question and anything they can ask. So if you solve these questions, means 10 questions you solve. Antidote of warfare and how you manage the warfare in toxicity. So first I need to get the answer, right? A diabetic female on tuber, uh, she has a tuberculosis on INH and rifampicin, right? She started on warfare now, right? And uh, PT is not raised. PT is like one. If you want to know the number exactly one, right? It's not raised. What's your next step? What should you do now? Yes, anyone can. You can post your answer in the chat box. You can post your answer in the chat box. We will discuss. I will tell the name. We will discuss. 
we'll discuss. This is a learning platform, so don't shy. I think, doctor, it's the first, it's A option, increase okay. dose of warfarin because rifampicin, uh, when we use rifampicin with other medicine, rifampicin uh, don't, um, it will destroy metabolism of warfarin. That's why I think so, we will increase dose of warfarin. Okay, so your answer is increased dose of warfarin. You also give the reasonable uh, explanations as well why you want to read the I mean, raise the dose of the warfarin. So let's see what other experts are saying. Dr. Asna Vargis, any comment? We'll discuss this. We'll discuss completely in detail, right? I'll not take more than one hour, but whatever we do, we will do it concretely. We don't need to mug up the answer. Asna Vargis, any comment? You posted A as well. And and there are lots of doctors, but only two answers. So I want you to put the answer. Don't worry. What what will you do if the same question comes in the exam? So don't hesitate to post your answer at least, right? You must uh, give answer of each and every questions. Yeah. So so basically, right? So okay, Doctor Murud, let me come to you. What what? So we will discuss this anyway. Now, Doctor Murud, tell me the warfare in how it works, on which clotting factor it works, clotting factor it works. Do you remember the clotting factors? Do you know? Yeah, the... yeah, of course. Yeah, so can you tell me some clotting factors which the warfarin acts on? This is again questions recently in DHA exam. They had given many options. It will can... affect the uh, prothrombin time. Yeah, so prothrombin time, it's not affect the prothrombin time. It is monitored by prothrombin time. So I'll give you complete logic of this. And it is extremely pathway I will, which is all the time confusing to the people. So let me first tell you the pathway, right? Let me tell you first the pathway, right? And it is, I made you so easy for you guys. So you never ever miss this pathway in your lifetime, right? So clotting... Okay. Cascade, we have seen many years, like we are reading from years and years, clotting the cascade, right? So what is clotting cascade? Is clotting cascade is a number of the clotting factors, right? Which helps to clot the blood. That is why it is a clotting cascade. So most easiest thing I came across by my experience of 20 years of clinical practice, you just keep in mind, right? So there are two pathways simply, I'll draw it here, right? This is the pathway and this is a common pathway. So this is a factor seven, right? This is seven. This is called as extrinsic pathway, extrinsic pathway. This is intrinsic pathway. One of the most easiest method in the world I discovered for learning for you guys, just to make it easily memorable. So this is extrinsic pathway, intrinsic pathway, when some extrinsic injury happens, Cut, wound injury, right? Extrinsic pathway will activate and it clots the blood. If something goes internally wrong, intrinsic pathway will activate and stop the bleeding. That is why it is a clot. So this is clotting cascade, not bleeding cascade. It is clotting cascade. So this factor helps in clotting. When you have bleeding, this factor helps in clotting. And if you miss any factor, any one of this factor, means you have bleeding. And there are various names. So factor seven, then here factor 8, factor 9, factor 11, factor 12. So that means 10 is missing. Here 10 is missing. So where is the 10? So 10 is in the common pathway. 10. Here 10. 2 multiply by 5 is 10. That's it. This is what called clotting cascade. And this will cause along with this calcium here. What it do? Prothrombin to thrombin. And fibrin. And fibrinogen to fibrin mesh or final clot. This is factor 13. Here we ended with 10. So it is one of the most easiest formula I can give you as per the book, but in simpler form, this is a factor 7, factor 8, factor 9, where is 10? So 10 is here in the common, right? 2 multiplied by 5, so 2, 5 and 10 is in the common pathway, common pathway, just for your remembrance, common pathway, 8, 9, 
11 and 12. That's it. This is what the clotting cascade. You don't need to mug up. You don't need to mug up. Next question. When the factor 8 is deficient, it is called as a hemophilia A. If it is factor 9 deficient, it is called hemophilia B. If it is factor 11 deficient, hemophilia C. That's it. This is what you need to remember. This is what you need to remember. Now the extrinsic pathway is monitored with a PT prothrombin time. And intrinsic pathway is monitored with APTT or activated partial thromboplastin time. So whenever any problem, there are 100 questions can be solved from this cascade, right? If somebody say factor 8 hemophilia develop, right? They usually present with the bleeding and right? They present with the hemarthrosis means bleeding in the joint, hemarthrosis, right? So this is a commonest presentation, right? Is It's a male predominant, right? So this patient comes, what is affected, PT or APTT? So APTT, just look at this, intrinsic pathway monitored by APTT, extrinsic pathway monitored by prothrombin time, right? So now hemophilia A, B or C, intrinsic pathway affected means what? The, how the blood picture should increase APTT and PT is normal. If you see the hemophilia patient, if you do the parameters PT and APTT, PT is normal, APTT will increase. Why? because it is not disturbing the extrinsic pathway. There is nothing to do in hemophilia with factor 7. It's 8, 9 and 11. That's it. So something disturbed in this left side, intrinsic PTT uh, is affected, something right side or extrinsic pathway PT. If both the things are affected, both will increase. Example, warfarin. So now let's come to the warfarin. So warfarin 2, 7, 9, 10, uh, 9, 8. So, warfarin effects on both the pathway, right? So, warfarin health effect, right? So, if you go for the warfarin, if you give the warfarin to someone, right? So, what effect, right? How many factors it affects? Factor 2, factor 7, factor 9, and factor 9. So, 2, 7, 9, 10. So, let's go to the basic 2, 7, 9, 10. So, 2 is in common, 10 is in common, 7 and 9. 2, 7, 9, 10. Right? So, 2, 7, 9, 10. So, when 2, 7, 9, 10 is means PT is increased, APTT can also be increased. Why? Because it's affecting the both the pathway. Right? Why PT? Because factor 7 is there. So, it's a PT. Right? 10, common pathway. 9, intrinsic pathway. So, intrinsic. So, 9, intrinsic means PTT increase. 7, AP, PT is also increased. Right, and this is how drug works. Right, so you need to know what drug acts on this. Right, so whenever warfarin, it will inhibit the two five ten. So it stop this. It will block this pathway. So clotting will not happen. Right, and blood become a thin, and that is why it's an anticoagulant drug. When you have clot, it is a coagulant drug. When the clot you want to dissolve, say for example, deep vein thrombosis, there is a clot. Pulmonary embolism, clot. Cerebrovascular thrombosis, clot. You need to dissolve clot, use warfarin, use w LMWH, right? Because there is a clot, you want to dissolve clot. So use the anticoagulant drug. Anti means against coagulation, means coagulation stop. Against clotting, it's X, so anticoagulants, right? So both things will be important in the body. Coagulation is important because if you start the natural bleeding inside the uh, tummy, say for example, Gastric bleed, there are clotting factors. If they are in normal amount, bleeding can be stopped naturally, right? Or if the factor is deficient, then bleeding will not stop, right? So when there is a clot, you need to give the, uh, when there is a clot, you need to give anticoagulant. When there is a bleeding, you need to give a coagulant drug, right? Like factor, why we are giving FFP in a bleeding patient? Because we are trying to put factors because factors are deficient. Say, for example, patient is coming to you with a DIC, disseminated intravascular coagulation. PT is increased, APTT is also increased. Fibrinogen is reduced, reduced fibrinogen and reduced platelet. This is the classical picture of DIC. So, how you gonna stop the bleeding? You give fibrinogen. You give PT, APTT means what? Clotting factor basically. PT, APT, clotting factor. Give FFP, ferrous frozen plasma. Give platelet transfusion, give cryoprecipitate. That's it. That is what the treatment is. That is what the treatment is. You don't need to mug up. So, whatever the factors are missing, you need to supplement it. Right? So, that's it. This is what the basic is. So, if you remember this chart, right? Say, for example, warfarin, I told you. Say, for example, I ask you second question, DHA question. Low molecular weight heparin. 
where it works low molecular weight so this is your homework where the low molecular if you this any anticoagulant drug works on this chart that's it this is clotting factor if you stop that clotting factor right it's anticoagulant right so i told you warfarin x14 factor 27910 your homework heparin where it works low molecular weight heparin where it works and doac doac write down if you don't remember drug direct oral anticoagulant drug or noac new newer oral anticoagulant by and large the same thing right so you need to have three things of homework heparin where it works low molecular heparin and this heparin is unfractionated heparin ufh unfractionated heparin low molecular heparin and newer oral anticoagulant drug two names dabigatran dabigatran rivorabaxan rivorabaxan epixaban these are the few oral drugs right better than warfarin now comes in the market for last decade which is extremely useful and we are using it very frequently clinically the biggest advantage of direct oral anticoagulant drug or neural or newer oral anticoagulant drug is you don't require the pt monitoring prothrombin time monitoring you don't required so this is the one of the biggest advantage right so those who are living in remote area they, they do not have because it is important na it's important so you need to understand this basic rather than just mugging up and now last but not the least the let me tell you the patient normal like say for example normal patient me if i check my pt now it is 1 to 1.2 this is normal this is normal somebody on warfarin say for example right so warfarin the goal of warfarin why we started warfarin either patient has a deep vein thrombosis all pulmonary embolism or clot anywhere in the body that is why we started this warfarin this is the common indication of warfarin right uh and uh, this goal is to keep between 2 to 3 at least 2 to 3 this is a called as a therapeutic what happens if it is less than 2 inr less than 2 on warfarin i am talking about on warfarin less than 2 it is not that effective not that effective or anticoagulant effect is not achieved if it is less than 2 if it is more than 2 blood is more thin so there is a chance of bleeding so both the way it's a problem here the problem of clotting right here is the problem of bleeding so it less than 2 right clot will not dissolve not effective so still dvt will not have much effect right if you this 3 4 5 7 more than 10 risk of bleeding patient may die one of my relative died on warfarin 6 years back 5 6 years back their inr is more than 2 minute nobody monitored patient presented with my one of my cousin uncle died of this more than 2 minutes is extreme this is this 2 to 3 right it should be 2 to 3 right anything more than 3 is abnormal right so he has a more than 2 minutes of difference right so it's a uh, right it's a huge difference right so he died of intracranial hemorrhage right not because of primary disease died because of warfarin toxicity that is what i want to say the biggest complication of warfarin is the bleeding right so this is another questions you go and read it the chart how you manage the things but i will clarify you today as well so here let's comes to the questions warfarin acts on the which factor so warfarin acts on the which factor that is a 2 7 9 10 this is the answer antidote of warfarin first and foremost especially non bleeding patient you start with the vitamin k that is antidote ask question in exam and if it is a bleeding patients better you use the ffp ffp right and how you manage the warfarin toxicity so warfarin toxicity manage on two things how much is the inr and bleeding is present or not bleeding is present or not present or not so say for example i told you on warfarin inr is 223 but somebody has a 5 inr with no bleeding patient is fine patient has no bleeding but if you did the blood pt inr international normalized ratio that is how it's read right so you must always any patients on the warfarin you need to monitor ptinr ptinr this is how we write in the clinical practice ptinr it is between 2 to 3 it is normal it's good means anticoagulant effect is very nicely achieved if it is less than 2 you need to increase the dose if it is more than 3 you need to reduce the dose why because more inr means more bleeding less inr means more clotting so if clotting is more you need to increase the dose to make it thin if it is more thin blood risk of increased bleeding you have to stop that drug 
So depends on the only two factor. What is the INR number one? Number plus bleeding is present or absent, right? So that's the chart is. So it is excellent chart, strong, right? So what's the chart showing? Overdose of warfarin, INR is less than five. No significant bleeding. Then you just adjust the dose of warfarin. That's it. My patient is not bleeding. So extremely important is clinical correlations as well. So you must have bleeding or no bleeding. Patient has a 5 to 9, more than 5 but less than 9. Again, no significant bleeding, right? Right, you can, it is 5 to 9 is quite high. So, what you can do here? Hold the dose of warfarin. So, you are taking 5 milligram warfarin every day, right? So, hold, completely hold. Again, after 48 hours, see the PTINR and then go ahead. So, here 5 to 9 with no bleeding. Hold the dose of warfarin and resume warfarin at the lower dose when INR is become therapeutic. So your INR is says for example 6 today, right? You check today means it's risk of bleeding. Stop for 1 or 2 day. Again check PTINR. If PTINR is say for example 3 from 6 to 3 after 72 hours. Here the dose was 5 milligram. And here you add once this 5 milligram, the, it becomes 6, right? What's your goal is between 2 to 3, but instead of 3, it becomes 6. So what you did, you stop the couple of doses. You did not give at all. Tomorrow and day after tomorrow, you did not give. And after that, you measure 3. So now reduce little dose. 3 to you can do 2.5. This is what they are trying to say. Hold the dose of warfarin. So we hold it for 2 days. And warfarin at lower therapeutic dose. So instead of 5, because 5 is, I mean 5 milligram is more. So you can you can reduce the dose to 2.53 depends and you adjust more than nine with or without bleeding. So anything more than nine is alarming. Anything more than nine, keep this number in mind. With or without bleeding, with or without bleeding, right? You can use the vitamin K as well as FFE, fresh frozen plasma, and there is one another drug comes in the market, prothrombin complex concentrate PCVC. Go and read it little bit. Nothing critical, but it's important for you to know. Right and serious bleeding, a patient has an intracranial hemorrhage and INR is 4. Right, so what they are saying any INR, any INR, whether INR is 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, don't bother whenever there is a serious bleeding, this is the treatment. Obviously, discontinue the warfarin, FFP 10 to 15 milligram per kg use and prothrombin complex concentrate. So, that's how you have to treat and you have to do the management of patients on the warfarin, right? So it is extremely important drug used very, very frequently in ICU. Every ICU, somebody is on warfarin. And I have seen plenty full of patients who died of warfarin because of not monitoring. They present with a, this is, they are saying here INR more than 9. And I am saying INR more than 120. Can you imagine? 9, they are worried. <laughs> I am telling about 120. I have seen many patients of mine only, right? So we counsel them properly, we explain them properly, but unfortunately they they did not turn up for the follow-up and they present with a very bad bleeding and bad INR in the emergency directly. And then it's a trouble for patients and uh, sometimes they may lose the life because of bleeding, which cannot be stopped, right? So that's the severity of warfarin. So deal with the warfarin, very serious things, serious business. So here the answer is the same what Dr. Murodai has told. Rifampicin concomitant used with warfarin result in a clinical significant drug to drug interaction. And this interaction leads to accelerated warfarin clearance and ultimately a reduction in anticoagulant effect. And that is how PTINR is not increased because rifampicin reduces the effect of warfarin, right? And that is why you need to increase the dose, right? So rifampicin has. Uh, Repulsions has been repeated to increase the warfarin requirement in human subject, right? Ingesting this anticoagulant, blah, blah. And rest of the things I explained to you. So not going much in detail. This is excellent. i given you the excellent chart as well of uh, this, how you monitor intrinsic and extrinsic pathway. So hopefully I'm clear from my side. Whatever you need to know the basic things for warfarin, intrinsic, extrinsic. I try my level best. More things to be discussed. But I'll switch to the next question. So do some homework. Go to the anticoagulant chapter very well given in few books, Harrison and uh, Master the Board. If you have any problem, just get back to me. Any questions for this? Any questions, Murad? You clear? 
Yeah, yeah, it's clear. Thank you. Wonderful. So that is nicely presented, if I'm not wrong. Wonderful. Yeah, it was very clear and very precise. Thank you so much. Excellent. Wonderful. So now just keep in mind because these are the very important high yield questions comes in exam. Uh, now second questions in front of your screen. Three years old patients with sickle cell anemia is brought to the emergency department complaining of pain in the in his lower arms for three days. On physical examination, both arms are swollen, tender and erythematous. He is febrile, means fever. Complaints of chills, leukocytosis is seen on the blood counts with prominent neutrophils. Which of the following is most appropriate treatment? Calcitonin, septriaxone, ciprofloxacin, etidronate, vitamin D. So again, those who are attending my mock test first time, new in this class or in this room, let me tell you, MCQ is the main questions comes in your exam for DHA 150 questions. You need to make habit of asking three questions in every MCQ. You need to ask these three questions. And if you develop this, you are champion. What is the diagnosis of scenario? What is the investigation or how you investigate and diagnose the condition? And once you diagnose the condition, how you treat? So for this is how I do for years and years. Any question comes to my OPD, I ask three questions to myself. What is the diagnosis of my patient? How am I supposed to investigate? What is the initial investigation and what is the best investigation for every scenario? Right? And what is the treatment of this diagnosis? That's it. So if you develop this habit, you are champion. Believe me, you are champion. What you are concentrating only just on treatment. They are asking you the treatment. Right? But they may ask you, how, what is the most sensitive and specific test to diagnose the sickle cell anemia? Say, for example, diagnosis they had given you. They had given you the diagnosis. Now they are asking you the treatment. What is the treatment? But without the knowing the concept, how you going to switch or jump to the treatment? So you always now. So say, for example, you are solving 50 MCQ a day means you are solving 150 MCQ because you need to know 50 diagnosis, 50 investigation and 50 treatment. So you are solving in one question, 50 question, 150 question. This is how I do in my practice. So you try to implement, it will be helpful to you. So now anybody wants to give me the answer, it's open for all. I mean, it's a, absolutely a, a debatable platform. So I'm glad that you can interact with me, right? So not I need just Murod, but any doctor. I mean, we are quite big numbers. Yes, Dr. Amit. Any any comment from your side, Dr. Amit? If you can able to interact with me, you can open up your mic. So we are lots of doctors and answer is two. I am not happy. Excuse me, doctor. Can I answer? No, no, no. Let the other people to try because, <laughs> sorry. Okay, okay. Sorry. I'll ask you the difficult one. You are more brilliant. Dr. Amina, any comment? Dr. Antara? Dr. Bahar Toprak? Any comment? I want you to interact. No? You can't sit quiet in the examination room. You need to answer something. It looks like not a good day for me for the discussion. Uh, hello? Yes, sir. Am I audible? Yes, sir. sir very much audible. Ceftriaxone is uh, indicated uh, because of the fever. Okay. Uh, Ciprofloxacin is not indicated because the uh, patient is three years old. It's not indicated in the pediatric patients. Okay. So, so let me little interact with you, sir, if you don't mind. So, what is the diagnosis here? First, you need to make some diagnosis that, okay, fine, this patient is this and this is suffering from this. What's the diagnosis, sir? Because as I told you, we need a three three things in any diagnosis. Sorry, sickle cell crisis. Sickle cell crisis. 
sickle cell crisis anybody also can comment on huh? sickle cell crisis so what do you think what is the crisis in this patient what crisis the sickle, the sickle cells are blocking the microvascular structures in the bone which is causing pain in the lower limbs so we can't okay fair enough so how many types of crisis there in sickle cell do you know no sir. crisis what crisis say for example sickle pain crisis have you heard of this or not did you do you know sir sickle cell crisis so pain crisis right acute chest syndrome right priapism right a plastic crisis have you heard of this yes or no yes. at least tell yes. me yes, yes or no yes right. so this yes, all are crisis you go and read it this is absolutely extremely high yield question sickle cell because there are lots of hemoglobinopathies in the middle east country i have seen plenty full when i was in oman i was treating lots of sickle right so this is extremely important right so what they are saying they are saying the sickle cell anemia is brought so they have given the diagnosis that 3 years child sickle cell anemia brought to the emergency for what they brought complaining of pain in lower arms physical examination pain is swollen tender erythematous right so this is kind of polydactyl polydactyl or polydactylosis right where you get the things and fever and complain of chills and leukocytosis so increasing count right so so this patient has a sickle cell and fever and leukocytosis means some kind of infection any patients comes to your opd with a fever and increase count what is the diagnosis this patient has some kind of infection in the body it is your job where is the infection to find out it is it could be uti it could be upper respiratory tract it could be abscess it could be pneumonia it could be anything because fever and total count increase in any kind of infections from head to toe you develop you get a fever plus you get a increased total count especially neutrophil so it is likely a bacterial infection if it is a lymphocyte could be a viral infection so this is a sickle cell crisis with some kind of bacterial infection can anyone tell me which is the most commonest bacteria in this bacteria the name of the bacteria all are mcqs in dha don't underestimate anyone which bacteria which is the bacteria this is question in exam recently they had given right which is the commonest streptococcus staphylococcus salmonella e coli this is the option for you now you tell me so salmonella is the option excellent wonderful so what is the answer this is in patient with sickle cell anemia the right the primary agent of osteomyelitis bone pain swollen joint right salmonella paratyphi and the staphylococcus aureus are the most commonest organism across the globe osteomyelitis more uh, is a common complication of sickle cell as the crisis may because there is a hampering of the blood flow right to the bones it gets osteomyelitic so uh, any antibiotic regimen will need to cover both organism right so which organism covers both staphylococcus and salmonella so third generation cephalosporin that is called as a ceftriaxon is an acceptable choice ciprofloxacin by age and cipro probably not cover both as it is better covered by the ceftriaxon compared with the ceftriaxon is more potent drug and safe as well at this age so that is why the answer of this question is a ceftriaxone calcitonin you need to know what is calcitonin why calcitonin right calcitonin is a drug which reduces calcitonin is the drug prothrombin increase the calcium and calcitonin is reduce the calcium so those patient who have hypercalcemia the drug of choice is a calcitonin so it's not useful here it is not useful vitamin d is not at all so you just need not to just answer the questions but you have to exclude the things one by one that is how you can improve your knowledge so here some kind of infection in sickle probably salmonella and staphylo covered by third generation batter and third generation so again one homework right 
So you need to know at least one one drug, right? If anybody can tell right away, I'm happy. First generation cephalosporin, second generation cephalosporin, third generation cephalosporin, fifth generation cephalosporin, and fifth generation. So there are five generations right now in the cephalosporin. Anybody know? I'm not asking you to give 10 names, only one name. Only one name. Cephazole in first line. Not first line, first generation. First line is oh, different, yeah, first, first generation is different. Yeah, first generation is Cephazole. Any common drug? Ciprofloxacin, sir. Ciprofloxacin, is it a cephalosporin? Do you know how many generation of cephalosporin? If you don't Attention. know, go and read the master the board. Excellent antibiotic lecture given, right? So cephalosporin, right? First generation, cephazolin or cephalaxin, cephalaxin. This is first generation. Second generation drug, cefuroxime. I'm giving you the common name. There are many drugs, right? But common, which people use across the globe. Third is a ceftriaxone. This is what the answer is, ceftriaxone. This is third generation, ceftriaxone, ceftriaxone. Fourth is a cefepime. Fifth, I remember is ceftarolin, ceftarolin. So you need to remember cephalosporin. What, why the generation is important? Number one, your homework. Why the generation is important, right? And which cephalosporin works which organism? These are the two homework for you today. You need to know. I don't need to remember 10 drugs in first generation. At least you should know because these are the drug which you're going to use clinically, no? So if I have patient sickle cell, I'm hematologist, some sickler come with fever leukocytosis, I think give septriaxone. That's it. I should know, no? being a clinician, what drug needs to be. If I give chloro ciprofloxacin, it is not that effective. Forget about three years, if even a 20 years of young gentleman comes to me, I use the same septriaxone. That's it. Is that clear to everyone? Yes or no? Tell me at least yes or no. So I think I, I feel that you all are awake, not like in a drowsy state. Yes, sir. Yes, wonderful. Yes, wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Sorry. Sorry to wake you up. So, probably this mock test could be eye-opener for you as well. Huh? So you get to know no, what, what's really going on in your preparation. A 27-year-old G1, Gravida 1 woman, 20 weeks pregnant. She is currently in her third year of family practice residency. Would like to travel Africa and Asia as a part of outreach mission with her program. She has received all of her childhood vaccinations. She presents to obstetric clinic inquiring about the safety of immunization during pregnancy. Which she is a 20 years, 20 weeks pregnant. Keep in mind, which of the following vaccine is contraindicated in pregnancy? Hepatitis A, hepatitis B, influenza, tetanus, typhoid, varicella. Think it. Varicella. It's easy question. It's easy questions, but listen it properly. Spend 10, 15 seconds. We'll discuss. We'll discuss. It's so, so I did not put all the toxic questions for you in mock test. It's easier as well. But you need to know what are the things. Yes. Anybody wants to interact, we can open up this again for discussion. Anyone? Yes, Radhika Pillai. Are you okay to discuss? Yes, sir. Wonderful. So now tell me what is the answer first. So I feel it's varicella. Okay, varicella. Varicella. Now you need to tell me what is the organism which caused the varicella. All DH exam. Herpes. Or hard or emotion. Sorry? Herpes. Herpes. Which herpes? Herpes. One, two, three. One, two, three. Zoster. Zoster. Herpes zoster. So, what is the name of the virus? Is herpes zoster, right? Or it's the name of the disease? It's the name of the uh, organism. 
नेम ऑफ द ऑर्गेनिज्म इज हर्पिस जॉस्टर आर यू श्योर नो सर आई थिंक इट्स अ डिजीज सॉरी हर्पिस जॉस्टर द डिजीज एक्जेक्टली या सो इट्स अ नेम ऑफ द डिजीज वी ओपन अप द चैप्टर रीड हर्पिस जॉस्टर सो हर्पिस जॉस्टर इज कॉज्ड बाय व्हिच वायरस वैरिसेला जॉस्टर आर यू श्योर Uh, not sure sir what okay so this is your homework dr radhika today it is very very common yes, sir. right varicella zoster or herpes zoster is in a in a pregnant immunocompromised diabetic mellitus patient patient on steroid because of any indication these are the extremely high risk people those who get at my chemotherapy patient anyway it is a immunocompromised chemotherapy so i have seen many herpes zoster so far in my this last two decades practice because immunocompromised they usually they get the things otherwise young healthy patient usually i have not seen young healthy patient who has herpes zoster who has no diabetes not on chemo not steroid nothing right very rarely because our immunity kills that virus won't go up to this herpes zoster so herpes zoster right it is also called as a shingles have you heard of this word shingles yes sir radhika so both are same thing shingles yes, or sir. herpes zoster and name of the virus is as you rightly said varicella zoster virus varicella zoster virus v z v right so you need to remember not just the diagnosis right because they can ask you anything if somebody has a varicella zoster how you gonna treat what is your treatment plan what is your treatment radhika what will you give to this patient say for example uh, this pregnant patient developed 20 weeks of pregnancy and they are saying now patient developed varicella zoster how you gonna treat this is the question now what could be your answer so acyclovir 5 times daily Acyc for 5 days acyclovir 800 ml 800 mg is it safe at 20 weeks of pregnancy i think so sir so your homework your homework otherwise you will not read sorry to give you homework oh, on sunday sorry. you go and read it i just turn it on sorry i don't know if it so so those who doesn't know about the herpes zoster right you should go and read it a cyclovir can be used during pregnancy in some cases but it is not recommended unless the potential benefit overweigh the risk of the fetus right so you need to balance risk and benefit right so here what's the answer she is inquiring about the immunization right and which of the following is contraindicated so any question comes in any of your prometric exam dhar dmoh oman whatever right so you need to know live vaccines live vaccines are absolutely contraindicated in pregnancy because pregnancy also considered as a immunocompromised state right so any live vaccine can end up with the active infection in pregnant woman and varicella is a live vaccine so you try to avoid it right so let's just check out what are the live vaccine and what are the live attenuated so contraindicated during pregnancy or safety is not established one of them is bcg influenza virus measles mumps and rubella cumulatively known as mrm varicella right right so these are the live vaccines live vaccines are absolutely contraindicated or avoid if there is a no much benefit then risk right so these are the vaccine you must remember this right they may ask you anything right so i just try to compile it on this uh, uh, one slide right so this is what the thing is vaccines recommended during pregnancy tt tetanus we are giving two doses in pregnancy tdap inactivated influenza is indicated what's contraindicated mmr measles mumps rubella varicella or varicella zoster virus or live influenza right inactivated influenza is indicated live vaccine is not indicated and bcg that's it so this is what your ho homework again once go and read it right so those who have so far we had solved three questions if you are not check your score 
less than 60 percent score is not good so you should have at least seven questions correct in today's mock test out of 10 or 9 right 70 percent should be correct then it's good score less than 50 is not need to work more hard on yourself right which of the following associated with the development of primary neuros nervous system lymphoma which of the following is associated with development of primary cns lymphoma so lymphoma is a lymphoid malignancy so in lymphoma there is a we'll discuss this lymphoma little five minutes to get better idea but is it eb virus epstein bar virus it is jc virus it is mycobacterium avium complex is it previous radiation exposure or toxoplasma gondii these are the organisms which can develop the primary cns lymphoma so which of the following is associated with primary cns lymphoma your time starts now you can put your answer in the chat box dr himaja any any comment dr himaja would you like to comment on this anything don't worry about right or wrong. I want to understand. Dr. Jubril. Any comment, Dr. Jubril? No comment, sir. No comment. So your answer is what? But if you have such questions in your exam, what could be your answer? I mean, what will you take? You need to take something. Don't keep it blank. This is my advice. Whatever. If you don't know anything, you take anything. So by chance or by luck, if it is correct, then you save your marks. Yes, Kanika, any comment there? Dr. Kanika, any comment? Sir, uh, not sure about it, but uh, I have random seen... Random guess. Yeah, random yes. guess. Like... Yeah, tell me. What, what do you think, I mean, something? Yes. So, what is central nervous system lymphoma? Kanika. Any idea? Uh, sir, uh, Epstein-Barr virus because of the immunosuppression. Your answer is B, right? Or A or C? A, sir. Your answer is A. Your answer is A? Yes, sir. Okay, wonderful. So, Epstein-Barr virus is associated with CNS lymphoma. So, basically, what is CNS lymphoma? So, if lymphoma in, involving the nervous system, there is a classification of lymphoma, mainly Hodgkin's lymphoma and non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. What is the major difference? This is There are hundreds of questions with this. So, I will quickly cover in two minutes. Hodgkin's lymphoma usually presentation is a cervical lymphadenopathy, cervical lymphadenopathy, non-tender. This is usually present with a disseminated disease, disseminated disease, widespread. Cervical lymph, uh, Hodgkin's lymphoma usually present in 7, 1 to 2 stage in 80% of the cases. And this is present in stage and 3 in 80%. So 80% present with the advanced disease. Here 80% present with the early disease, stage 1 and 2. Right, Hodgkin's lymphoma, the histologically, the most important thing is a reed Sternberg cell. reed Sternberg cell. What is reed Sternberg cell? If you cut the lymph node, you get to see there's such kind of all eye appearance, all eye appearance. This is called as a reed Sternberg cell. This is all eye. If you see the all, this is also in big book, it is written as a all eye appearance of the lymph node. This is the lymph node cut and you see exactly like this. It is present of RSL. Reed and Sternberg. So, these are the one fellow, this is another fellow. So, Mr. Reed and Mr. Sternberg, they found first, that is why it is called as a RS cell or Reed Sternberg cell, which is seen. If it is present, it is Hodgkin's lymphoma 100%. 
If it is absent, it is a non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. So in non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, red Sternberg cell is not seen. And treatment, talk about the treatment of Hodgkin's lymphoma. The main treatment is chemotherapy. There are four drugs, ABVD. F stands for adriamycin, adriamycin. B stands for bleomycin, bleomycin. V stands for vincristin, V stands for vincristin. And D stands for dacarbazine, dacarbazine. Or shortly, sometimes people in our clinical term called as a DTIC. Toxicity of adriamycin is cardiotoxicity. Extremely high yield questions asked in exam. Bleomycin is a pulmonary toxicity in exam. Vincristine, again, it's a peripheral neuropathy. And dacarbazine is a pulmonary fibrosis or pulmonary toxicity. This, That's it. This is absolute high yield point for lymphoma. They won't ask you much about this. Right. Even more in detail, Hodgkin's lymphoma, poor entity, Hodgkin's lymphoma, histological issue, nodular sclerosis, mixed cellularity, lymphocyte predominant and lymphocyte depleted. Most commonest, if they ask what is the most commonest, nodular sclerosis. Second most common is mixed cellularity. Best prognosis, lymphocyte predominant. Worst prognosis, lymphocyte depleted. So one question, four question. What are the various subtype of Hodgkin's lymphoma? What is most common number one question second most question second most common what which hodgkin's lymphoma has the best prognosis if you treat they live long more than five years survival is 99 percent or almost 90 percent very high cure or survival is lymphocyte depleted best prognosis worst prognosis lymphocyte depleted again non-hodgkin's lymphoma which is the highest or most aggressive burkitt lymphoma burkitt lymphoma burkitt's lymphoma Right, it is a very high, high grade or high risk, right? Or poor prognosis. If you don't treat, they die fast. Second, right, is a there are long list of lymphoma, but this is what you need to know. Burkitt lymphoma, diffuse large B cell lymphoma, good good prognosis, very good prognosis, follicular lymphoma. So there are various kind of lymphoma. Sometimes, if you are interested, I'll take you a bit in detail of lymphoma. Right, and here the treatment is what? Here the treatment is here ABVD, here the treatment is RCHOP. RCHOP. R stands for retoximab, it is anti CD20 antibody monoclonal. C, doxorubicin, cyclophosphamide, vincristin, and P stands for prednisone. Sorry, here I had one mistake. Here not vincristin, here vinblastin. Sorry. Both are little different, same but different. Adriamycin, bleomycin, vinblastin and dacarbazine here vincristin. Right? So these are the drug, RCHOP. So this is a drug. So you need to go and read the chapter of lymphoma. Lymphoma. This is what it will come. Everything will come. What I explained in one slide. It is little bit in detail. But these are the high yield exam point of view. I explained you what they ask. Right? So here the answer is uh, abstain by virus for the exam point of view. Virtually all causes primary CNS lymphoma in patient with HIV are associated with the here, yeah, is the abstain by virus, right? Rest of the other thing, JC virus, right, is not associated with CNS lymphoma for your knowledge. So JC is not the answer. Somebody given mycobacterium avium. So it is not associated with primary CNS. What the question is? Primary CNS lymphoma. If you go and read it, what the question is? A primary CNS lymphoma. So lymphoma in lymph node is not CNS lymphoma. Something bad because of lymphoma in brain and spinal cord, it is called CNS lymphoma. Central nervous system lymphoma. So every lymphoma is not primary CNS lymphoma. So it's a different entity. Non-Hodgkin's lymphoma primary CNS lymphoma and non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. So if it is, uh, right, in the brain and spine, it is primary CNS lymphoma. So it is not JC virus. It is not mycobacterium as per the literature. It is not associated. And uh, this radiation exposure doesn't cause the lymphoma. And infection with T. gondii leads to encephalitis, not the lymphoma. That's it. So this is what the thing is. So you need to understand and remember the things. Easier questions next for you. Last couple of uh, four or five questions. Bear with me. Elderly patients complaining of urination during night and describe when he feels the bladder is full 
and need to wake up to urinate, he suddenly urinate on his bed. What is this? Urgency incontinence, urge incontinence, stress incontinence, flow incontinence. So what is this? Read the questions once again yourself. Try to post your answer. Yes, Dr. Antara, I want you to interact. What's your answer, Dr. Antara? Urge incontinence yeah. or... Yeah. Sorry, doctor? Urge, urge incontinence. I was confused between urge and flow, but I think... Okay, so what is the difference between urge, stress and flow incontinence? Can you describe me a little bit? So, I, I, I lock your answer as a urge incontinence because you give an urge incontinence. Okay, fine. So, now I want to understand from you, doctor, that what is the rest of the things? What are the rest of the things? What is stress incontinence? Right? How you define stress incontinence? How you define flow incontinence? How you define urge incontinence? Any idea or no idea? Yes or no? It's okay. Fine. It's a learning platform. Yes, Antara. Any comment? Yes, so first put the answer and then anyone can give me the difference between three or how you differentiate. Okay, sir. This is this type of patient comes present to you in OPD, IPD. It's urge incontinence. This is stress incontinence. This is flow incontinence. Anyone open for all. Not just the... So stress incontinence is when you laugh or uh, cough, uh, you, laugh you can't hold cough. back the urine. Right. So, so can I, I mean, simplify it when there is a stress or when there is an increase intra-abdominal pressure or something like that, it will, or something like stress, it can do incontinence. Fine. So, so, so nobody answering me means nobody had the clarity about these three terms. Very frequently asked questions, so simple but important. And I, I selected specifically the tricky one, so you get to know that where. Sir, where about. Uh, yes, please. Sir, about urge incontinence, it is the involuntary uh, urination. Uh, uh, involuntary when urination. There is, uh, there is a Yes, sir, involuntary urination uh, or uncontrolled urination uh, during the day or night. And mostly it, it used to be happen in elder, el elderly patients. Okay. So what happens? Any, 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 any condition you can, any condition you can tell me that this is the um, condition when, where you can get the urge incontinence. Any disease name? Any disease, disease sir? Uh, uh, like... Uh, in, uh, in okay, so you mean to say BPH, benign prostatic hypertrophy, there is an urge incontinence, right? Yes, sir. Any okay, nervous fine. system, any nervous system problems, Parkinson's disease, because it has a detrous instability. So, mm -hmm. uh, so when they get the urge, they have to pass it then and there, so they have increased. Uh, Frequency and urgency I mean when they get the feeling they have to pass urine. Unlike stress incontinence, it's because of the increase in abdominal pressure and the pelvic mm. floor muscles that will um it, it'll push it down. So urgency is Fair mainly enough. Fair enough. Going well. And the and flow in flow. So basically your bladder is really full and it just keeps flowing. So it happens when you have like a BPH and when you have a chronic urine retention, it keeps flowing continuously. Mm -hmm. So by history, how you can differentiate this is urge incontinence and this is flow incontinence? By history, uh, if somebody, some patient comes to you, is there any way to figure it out? Sir, by history, this is urge incontinence. Sir, by this, this is a overflow incontinence or flow incontinence. Just so when you ask from concept. the history, yeah, so when you ask from the history, they could be having a history of um, some of these medical conditions like BPH or they have been uh, chronically catheterized mul multiple times to, uh, because they have had acute urinary retention or whatever. Mm -hmm. Whereas people who have urge incontinence, they'll come with symptoms like uh, they have the urgency and they have to pass then and there and they can't wait. Fair enough. 
Fair enough. Fair enough. I'm happy with the answers of everybody. And you extremely mentioned well. So, urge incontinence is a common form of incontinence. You have an urgent desire to pass urine and sometimes urine leaks before you have time to get to the toilet. Urge. It is usually due to overactive bladder. Right? You are not doing anything. It's not in your control. Right? You want to pass, but before you go there, you wet. Treatment is bladder retaining right and medication may also be advised to relax the bladder because it's a bladder overactive this is a nice picture i got it for you guys overflow urethral blockage overflow right bladder unable to empty properly unable to empty properly that is why it's overflowing flowing flowing stress incontinence relax either two problem either relax pelvic floor or increase intra-abdominal pressure. So, increase intra-abdominal pressure pushes the urine out, right? Or, or this pelvic floors are relaxed. So, it's a, these are the two things. An urge, bladder oversensitivity from infections or doctor rightly said the neurological disorder or Parkinson. So, urge, right? So, here the answer is urge. Urge means, I mean, you need to pass. You need to pass, right? It's not in your control. Even if you're going to the toilet before it happens, right? So, urge incontinence. So, remember all these various, various terms. Urge, overflow and stress. They ask commonly, very commonly to you. So, keep in mind. So Next then, question. So, urgency incontinence? That is not the term. It's just to confuse us. Okay. <laughs> there is nothing a term like urgency incontinence. It's the urge oh. incontinence. But make you to make you a little more confused between urgency and urge. That is why I posted this option. Okay, but okay. in book, there is nothing, no word like urgency incontinence. It's urgent incontinence. Okay, a patient thanks. present with a chest... No problem, you're welcome. The patient presented with a chest pain for two hours. Extremely important. Hundreds of questions we'll discuss and probably we'll stop at this question. But this question will open up the mind of all coronary artery disease questions we will discuss in this last slide. Patient present with a chest pain for two hours with anterior lateral lead showing ST elevation, hospital has no PCI, full form of PCI is percutaneous coronary intervention facility. Patient, hospital does not have PCI facility. What is the next step most appropriate in the management? Diagnosis, we did it. Anterolateral lead showing ST elevation means looks like a STEMI. Now you want to treat this patient. You don't have PCI in your hospital somehow, right? What is the next step? Are you going to do streptokinase, oh, nitroglycerin, no. ASA and beta blocker? Let me finish first. B, nitroglycerin, ASA is aspirin, ecosprin, that is the ASA, heparin and beta blocker. C is nitroglycerin, ASA, right, heparin, uh, sorry, beta blocker and D is LT plus nitroglycerin, heparin, beta blocker. I need at least 10 answers in the chat box. Then I can able to discuss more. So you post, you keep in your mind. What's your answer? We'll discuss. We'll discuss. Extremely important questions. Dr. Samna, now I would like to discuss these questions in detail with you. Dr. Samna, are you okay? Yes. Are you willing? Yes, are you comfortable? Sir. Yes, sir. Wonderful. It's... You never forget. Huh? After discussing with me, you will never forget. At least this. So, first of all, tell me, what is the diagnosis? So there is uh, ST elevation in uh, anterior and lateral leads. Okay, wonderful. Anterior and anterior. So, this is basically anterior lateral STEMI, right? Because ST yes. elevated. So, first yes. of all, right, diagnosis of myocardial infarction is only 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 on ecg yes. if you want to do only one test to diagnose the condition of heart disease the extremely important test is ecg and unfortunately this is my own statement it is underutilized investigated and underutilized and there are millions of people dying because of underutilization of EUSG. Let me tell you, I am not a cardiologist. 
I am a hemat oncologist, but I have seen a patient in my residency, 18 years, died of acute MI, 28 years, died of acute MI, 38 years, died of acute MI, 48 years, died of acute MI, and 98 years, MI. The bottom line is that young patient dying from acute MI, oldest of the oldest die. So never ever, right, get a bias in your mind and brain that, oh, young patient, chest pain, nothing to happen. It's gastroesophageal reflux disease. Give pentoprazole, rabeprazole, lensoprazole. Get back them home. Never ever do this practice. This is hardcore experience I'm telling you. Keep a one fixed set in your mind. Write down this. This is written in my, my clinic. Is that clear? Chest pain. Anybody coming, even 15 years of male come with me, I will take one ECG. It's underutilized now. What's the problem if you do the ECG? If it is ECG, it's normal in 15 years of boy. What's the problem? Okay, fine. It's not a cardiac thing. It's not acute MI. But if you miss this in 15 years of boy, 18 years of boy, and if he is dying because of not diagnosing the things on time, it's a big crime. It's a big medical legal issue you will not sleep well because you missed that part and young boy died. What is the cost of ECG? Nothing. What is the cost of ECG? Nothing. Few bucks, ECG putting a issue. Always, 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 even my oncology patient advise breast cancer patient cell chest pain, colon cancer patient say chest pain. Any patient comes to me and tell me chest pain, I'll just do baseline ECG. That's it. That's it. That's it. So don't never ever hesitate to ask for the ECG in any practice across the globe. Chest pain is equal to ECG. This is my sentence. It is not in the book, but this is my sentence. Chest pain is equal to ECG. So if any patient complain of chest pain, do ECG. That's it. Number one. So this is one of the most important. Whatever you do, you do ECG, you do enzyme, right? Now, second important point. This all questions in DHA, huh? don't underestimate. So am I, how you diagnose, number one is ECG, right? And let me tell you, diabetic patient, they have silent MI, silent MI, silent MI means they don't have even a chest pain. They don't have chest pain because of diabetic, there, are, there is a neuropathy, right? So even they don't feel pain. This is called as a silent MI. So how you get to know that this patient has a MI? Only, only an ECG. So only one investigation if somebody asked me to do in chest pain management is number one ECG. Second thing is enzyme. E ECG will give you idea in just 10, 15 minutes huh? for your knowledge. 15 minutes. Remember the time frame. Within 10 to 15 minutes, there is a changes of acute coronary syndrome in ECG. So it, this is fastest test. Most reliable and it will not give you idea about the acute MI. It will give give you idea about STEMI versus non-STEMI. It will guide you idea about the coronary blockage. Where is the coronary blockage? Say, for example, lead 2, lead 3, and AVF, inferior wall MI. Inferior wall MI usually happen with the right coronary artery. So right coronary or left coronary involved, that is also you can suspect from the which lead involves. We'll get to you in the detail. So MI is equal to ECG enzyme. There are three questions in enzyme in an exam. They usually ask. First exam. If they ask simply which protein is fastest increase in the plasma, answer is myoglobin. Remember, huh? this is myoglobin. Fastest raised which enzymes in plasma, myoglobin. Which protein has a, right, has a more sensitive and specific, more sensitive and specific for acute MI, Answer is troponin I. Which enzyme helps to detect the recurrence of myocardial infarction? Recurrence of myocardial infarction. CKMB. See the three different answer. Question. If they ask which is the fastest protein. So somebody get developed the acute MI. Within one hour, which is the first enzymes gets elevated in plasma myoglobin. 
right? But myoglobin, why then you have answers? Then why, sir, we are not doing myoglobin? I never ask for myoglobin. I always listen for years and years. Drop T, drop I and C can be why? Because it is not specific and sensitive because it can increase with the muscle injury, skeletal muscle injury, strain, over-exercise, right? Injury, fall. There are lots of reasons where there is a muscle injured myoglobin will increase. So it is not sensitive and specific and that is why it is not done in the clinical practice. If you have a calf muscle injury, if you have back injury, you have gluteal muscle injury, you have paraspinal muscle injury, myoglobin may increase. That does not mean it's acute MI. So, but exam point of view, if they ask which enzyme elevate first myoglobin, which is more sensitive and specific, troponin I, and which is, which enzyme gives you idea about the recurrence. Say for example, little more clarity, we'll get little more clarity. So here troponin T, troponin T and CKMB. Difference. Troponin will start increase in the plasma at around 4 hours. So if patient developed 12 o'clock MI, before 4, prop I will be normal. So you cannot get the idea. Prop I is normal, negative. So you say, oh, this is not MI, you go home. You did not ECG. You, you misdiagnose the patient. right? So, so, so this is also increase in 1 to 4 hours. It will remain the peak 12 to 24 hours, right? And it will remain in the plasma for one to two day. This is the difference. And here, the difference is one to two weeks. This is how I remember. I try to always try to make a thing simpler. Here, one to two week. Here, one to two days. In books, they have written sometimes 10 to 14 days. In master the board, they, but this is easier way. One to two weeks, they remain in the plasma. So say for example, today is a six date, somebody developed acute MI, max two weeks, means up to 20th of October, 14 days, this drop will positive, this troponin will be positive. So you cannot get the idea that a oh, patient has a second MI or recurrence of MI, here you get the idea. Same example, 6th of the October, somebody will develop the MI, this remain max two days, means 8th of the 10th October, this elevated and from 9th of the October, this is normal. 9th of the October, if you do CKMB, it's gone from the urine, it's lost. Again, this patient developed on 12th of the October. Again, there is a raised in the CKMB, means it is a recurrent MI. Here, 12th of the October, you cannot get anything. Why? Because 12th of the October, it is increased. 13, 14, up to 20, it's elevated. So, you did not get an idea. Right? So, if somebody develops within the two weeks the recurrent MI, which enzymes are, helps to know is the CKMB. So, that's the answer in the exam. Let's come to the set, the third point, which is the treatment part, which is extremely important. I put a four blocks for you to understand and clarify the thought process so you never ever miss any treatment, any part of the acute myocardial infarction. And this is the number one killer across the globe in India, in UA, in Middle East and across the globe. Highest number of people dying in every country is myocardial infarction. So you must know. First of all, stable angina, unstable angina, non-stemming, stemming, poor entity. Presentation of stable angina, chest pain, unstable angina, chest pain, chest pain chest pain. How you relieve this, these things? How you relieve? Rest relieve the stable angina. Rest no, not relieved. Not relieved by rest. You need to do something. This is also not relieved by rest. This is also not relieved by rest. ECG, stable angina, normal. Unstable angina, mostly normal. Non normal or T inversion, you can say. Sometimes T inversion. Non-STEMI, non-STEMI can present in three ways. One is ST depression, T inversion. And STEMI, the name is itself ST elevation. That is why the name comes, no? STEMI, full form. ST, ST means ST segment in Right. So again, we need to know the basic things. This is P, this is Q, this is R, this is S, T. 
P Q R S T. This is ECG. If somebody have a lot of confusion, go and uh, look at the Dr. Maddy's lecture of my cardiology. Brilliant speaker. Right. So Maddy will guide how to do this ECG. How what are the various kinds of ECG and how you interpret exam point of view. Brilliant lecture available on YouTube. I'll share the YouTube link. Go and find out and subscribe medical MCQ for brilliant lectures. All lectures, what I'm taking and others uploaded. So go and read it. Complete lecture of ECG and arrhythmias. You will be expert. So ST elevation, that is how the name came. Enzyme. What happens to enzymes? This is stable angina. It is not a myocardial infarction. This both are myocardial infarction. This is not a myocardial infarction. This is not a myocardial infarction. So enzymes is normal. Enzymes is normal. Enzyme is elevated. Enzyme is elevated. Right? And last but not the least, treatment. Stable angina, you just give the rest. Patient will be fine because there is a ischemia little which can be relieved by this. This is not relieved by rest. So you can need to give aspirin. All right? And evaluate. non stemming and stemming. So this is, I want to go a bit in detail. Five more minutes, bear with me. Right, so I want to uh, add one more slide. All right, because it is extremely important, this point, and they are asking thousand times these questions. non stemmy and this is STEMI. First treatment or we called in book as a pre-hospital care before patients reach to the hospital because most of the MI developed at home, not in the hospital, most of. So when there is a chest pain in foreign or in developed country, they call the ambulance, they call 911 in US and all blah, blah, or this number in India, it is 108, 108. We call, ambulance will come and pre-hospital, before you reach to the hospital, first and foremost thing is a Mona. Mona. What is Mona? Morphine. Oxygen. Nitrate. Aspirin. This is life-saving. This is life-saving. So, Mona is number one. Mona is number one. You cannot bypass Mona. You cannot do PCI. You cannot do angiography with, before Mona. Nobody across the globe bypassing the Mona. Mona is important. This is one question. So what is Mona? Morphine, oxygen, nitrate, aspirin. Right? Another question. Lots of questions. Nitrates. Contraindicated nitrates. Contraindicated. So when patient has a less than 90 systolic, do not give the nitrates. Patient on sildenafil or Viagra, sildenafil. Patient, there are lots of patients in Western world on Viagra, right, for erectile dysfunction or pulmonary hypertension. They are on sildenafil, the brand famous across the globe is Viagra. Right, so those patients are hypotensive. Those patients are on sildenafil, which drug is contraindicated nitrate? Absolutely all exam point of view, I'm telling you. Oxygen can be given in all patients. Morphine just relieve the pain. Amongst four, Mona, which is the drug which increases the survival of the patient? Only one drug. So if you have one option, if I can tell you, select only one drug from Mona, what you will give? Aspirin. Because it reduces the 25% of mortality in acute myocardial infarction and uh, and 50% in unst unstable angina or non stemmy so it reduces the death so you by giving just aspirin one in four patient can be saved cost is nothing it's almost like nothing even i can't say the money <laughs> nothing is right even in I can tell in dirham, it is less than one dirham. <laughs> so nothing, right? It's a life-saving drug. So these all are the important points, right? So let's get back again to the Mona part. 
So there is little change in the management of STEMI and non-STEMI. So first and foremost, as I told you, how you manage the STEMI, right? So non-STEMI and STEMI, non, and this is STEMI, ST elevated. So first initial treatment, any patients comes to your emergency Mona, keep the Mona in mind. Here the treatment will change. Which is worst? Mona, non-STEMI is bad or STEMI is bad? STEM is the worst, is the worst. So if you have a two patient at the same time in your OPD, one is STEMI and non-STEMI, to whom you attend first? Usually I go with the STEMI. STEMI is a 100% blockage of the coronary artery. Let me draw the picture. This is coronary. This is atheromatous plaque. No blood is flowing from this side to this side. 100% block. What is the picture in non-STEMI? Still there is a blood flow. Still there is a blood flow. Still there is a flow. Still there is a space from the blood to supply to the muscle of the heart. Where the coronary supply is the myocardium of the heart. This is myocardium. This is coronary artery. This is myocardium. So still there is a, some blood is getting to the muscle of the heart. Right? And when there is a dying of muscle of heart, it increases the enzyme. Troponin T and CKMB. Here increase because the muscle is not getting blood supply. So both the side enzyme is increased. It is 100% blocked. This is more fatal. So if they ask which is a more fatal, right, or prognostically bad, it is STEMI. So first treatment for both the thing is STEMI. Here the treatment chain. Here the 100% block. You need to open as soon as possible. The primary pathology is this. The, here the treatment chain. Based is a PCI. Based is a PCI. Percutaneous coronary intervention is the best treatment, PCA, per, percutaneous coronary intervention. And here, PCA is not the things. Here, you give the thrombolytic. Oh, sorry. Heparin. non stem Here, the first is the PCI. And the question is, if your hospital does not have PCI, then what you use? Then thrombolytic. Streptokinase urokinase or ultiplase. This is the treatment of choice. When? When you have no PCI in your hospital. Right? So, you give the thrombolytic streptokinase and then use the PCI. That's it. This is how you can manage this patient. Here, heparin. Why here the no, no streptokinase? Why here no thrombolytic, no streptokinase? Why? Because it does not give the mortality advantage. Same people will die. Whether you give streptokinase or you give the heparin, same patient. If you give 100 acute MI patient, 50 will live. Yes, streptokinase, 100 patient, 50 will live. Means you will not get the mortality advantage. But the toxicity what you get is streptokinase in non-STEMI is the excessive risk of bleeding, especially in elderly people. So bleeding is the additional risk factor. So that is why considering risk benefit and mortality advantage in non-STEMI, you use the heparin. And after heparin, what is the third treatment? You go for the PCI means you do the angiography. Conventional tre treatment is angiography. So you do angiography, try to find out what is the cause, right? So in angiography, what you see? Single vessel, double vessel or triple vessel disease. Single and double vessel disease treatment usually is a uh, this uh, PTCA. Percutaneous transluminal coronary angioplasty, PTCA. Or primary angioplasty you can do. And when there is a triple vessel disease, right? Ideal treatment is cabbage. Coronary artery bypass grafting. Right? This is how you need to treat. Right? So here the first mona is same for both the things. Morphine, oxygen, nitrate, aspirin. Here the heparin. After giving the heparin, right? Opening the things more. Right? Restoring the blood supply as soon as possible fast. Then you do. Otherwise, if you don't do the angioplasty, this patient comes with the MI. Now it is 80% block. After one year, it is 100% block. So you need to know how much is the block. Right? And that is why you need to do the angiography. And depends on the angiography, you need to treat patient angioplasty. Right? Angioplasty versus cabbage or bypass surgery. That's how. And here, what's the difference? Mona. After Mona, you should give PCI. If PCI is not available in thrombolytic, and after doing thrombolytic, you refer this patient. You refer this patient to the hospital where PCI is available. Do the patient's angiography and find out what is the problem. And depends on the angiography, single vessel, double vessel, triple vessel. You try to treat this patient. 
as per the coronary blockage. So these all are the high yield questions from my side. There are hundreds of things to discuss, but I conclude my talk for the today and I wish you read all the topics well. So now let's uh, go for a little quick feedback, those who attended my class first time. And last but not the least, thank you very much all for listening to me. I tried my level best to make you understand the concept clearly, though we discussed six, seven questions, but I think it's equivalent to 50 questions for your exam because we discuss a lot of things in a one question. So, so I just spare more five minutes with you, then we'll pack up this class. So any, any feedback from the class, those who joined first time, how was your experience and what you did learn new things first time? Any comment? Couple of people, quick. Any comment from you, Dr. Samna? I think you joined first time, I guess. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, my how first. Was, how, how was your experience in the class? Uh, it, it was uh, really amazing, sir. I got to cover a lot of topics. In this one hour, I got to uh, cover a lot of topics and uh, also. I just showed me where I stand and what more I should focus on, read. Okay, great. So anything fascinating to you today, which you not learned in your MBBS or in your graduation or something more tricks and tips from my side? From, something... from each topic, I had something to learn, sir. Uh, from each topic, from all these questions, I had something to learn. Wonderful. So you enjoyed overall? Yeah, exactly, sir. Wonderful. Thank you very much for your kind. Thank comment. you very much. Thank you. And uh, we have every Sunday this mock test. So let's see. Let's connect to you. Anyone else? First time, I don't know. There are a lot of doctors. So by personally, short form is there. I don't know. Is first time, second time. Anyone? Any comment? So you are probably not the one who joined first time. There must be few people are there. Dr. Ishwari, I think you joined first sir, time. Ishwari, I'm yeah. sorry, sir. I'm from Pakistan, Dr. Shibabta. Uh, this is my third, fourth MOOC test with you. And uh, as I said last time, sir, you always, every time you covered so many topics in just one scenario, this is amazing. Uh, I, I hardly see, I, I, I hardly seen any teacher or any mentor who used to do the practice like that. And seriously, we are blessed to have you. Uh, and in such MOOC examinations, in the MOOC, MOOC test, you used to cover so many topics at the same time. And it covered almost everything, every system, every topic. So very much thankful to you, sir. No, no, my pleasure, doctor. Thank you for your kind words. I'm really excited and motivated as well. Thank you. Yeah, last, Sayyid Maria. Any comment, then we'll pack up this session. Any comment, Dr. Sayyid Maria? Hello, yes, sir. It was such a fascinating uh, one hour of my day. It just made my day, actually. I learned so many things and it has all, almost, it, it's like a brain awakening for me so that mm -hmm. I should focus on the topics more and to make, like, the concepts are so clear as per the one question you have discussed. Six questions, is, it's like almost uh, covering almost eight to ten topics, I feel. Thank you so oh, much. Yeah. Thank you for your kind feedback. So all, thank you very much all for joining. We'll see you with the next MOOC. You can register. The link will be given for next uh, is on 13th of the October is our next MOOC. As usual, same time, same thing with new more concept and new excellent MCQ. So thank you all for joining. You can post your review in the group as well. Thank you very much. See you. Take care and enjoy your Sunday. Thank you very much.